challenges of uh, of uh, going live is that you get live experiences. So we've just got another experience. Uh, but anyway, we, we're finally here. Uh, look, welcome to uh, another episode of Securities Lending Live with Pierpoint. And thanks for not only joining us, uh, but sticking with us. Um, so the objective of these events is to discuss topical issues and themes but really give you a chance to actually participate in the conversation. So uh, hopefully uh, we've got people live on now. The Everything is telling me that it's all Morning, live yes. and we're good. Uh, so just one us. second. So um, yeah, so what I really want you to do is engage. I've got a panel of experts here that all have different perspectives on the business. And this is your opportunity to ask questions, engage with them, uh, challenge us if you disagree and give your own sort of perspective. So uh, practically what's gonna happen is I'm your host. So if you see me looking to the left or looking to the right, I'm also the producer uh, keeping it going. Uh, in If you have comments, suggestions, or uh, you wanna tell us where you're watching from, put it in the chat uh, down below and we'll actually see this. There's about a 20 to 30 second uh, delay between uh, the the you putting it in and us being able to see it. And we always get to all of the comments either during the show or afterwards, so stick with it. Um, today, the story is GameStop. There's never been a more timely issue, so we wanted to bring that to you. Last week, we talked about uh, Comex trades. Again, another controversial uh, topic, uh, and we're doing it again this week. So now I'm gonna turn to the panelists and ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, if I can start with you, please, uh, Ben. Hi. Uh, my name is Ben Arnold. I'm the uh, founding partner and CEO of Merikai Global Advisors. Uh, we are a global multi-asset buy-side trading platform that investment teams can understand and identify with. Um, we have a unique co-sourcing model that mimics a buy-side trading desk by eliminating conflicts of interest and sell-side activities, structures, and functions. Uh, we're headquartered in Park City, Utah, uh, where I am, and we have offices around the world in Hong Kong and New York. And uh, we're excited to be here. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much, Ben. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, if I can now turn to Mike. Sure. Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, I work alongside Ben and run our strategy and business development group. And um, I'm actually talking today from California. Great. So thanks very much for that, Michael. Um, as the audience might expect, uh, we'll be turning to you, Ben and Michael, to talk about trading-related issues and use your sort of vast experience covering the community and, and within markets. Uh, so uh, looking forward to hearing from you there. Uh, next, if I can actually ask Sam to introduce himself. Thanks, Roy. Uh, I'm Sam Pearson. I uh, work at IHS Market Securities Finance, where we help our clients across the securities finance value chain with various uh, data and related needs. And, and uh, Sam, you are indeed Mr. Data, and you have some charts to prove it. Uh, so now I'll turn over to, uh, to my colleague, John. Good afternoon. Uh, John Arneson, I'm the consultant for uh, PairPoint. PairPoint, we, um, we help clients in the securities finance industry meet whatever goals that they, uh, they deem need helping with. Um, interestingly, we also are working uh, in a collaborative way on certain infrastructure issues that the industry probably is crying out for that we hope to bring to market at some point. Right. Okay. So that kind of sets the scene. So as you can see, we'll be talking about trading related issues, the securities finance market data as it shows up. And then we'll also be just having a, a general conversation about it. So feel free to ask about, uh, uh, about anything related to it. We may, uh, we may swerve it, but we're not politicians, so we'll we'll try to take it on a head on. So let me first say a few hellos. So uh, Gregor, hello from uh, Slovenia. I uh, appreciate you joining us every week. Uh, Graham uh, is no doubt uh, joining us from Dubai because there's no extradition treaty. So uh, hopefully everything's working out. <laughs> Great, Graham. Um, uh, Mahesh, uh, thanks to the UK. The UK is winning because Victor is also watching from the UK. And Jeroen, hope the new job's going well. And uh, thanks for joining us from Amsterdam. So that's that's really the background. That's who's going to uh, be talking to you. Um, look, where are we? 
GameStop, a stock that uh, has progressively been losing money. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, people 5, 10, 15 years ago probably uh, bought things from in the past, but probably less so today. So it's not a surprise that that's been working through the financials. The company was a, a money loser last year. They did worse than the year before. Uh, and uh, short sellers, unsurprisingly, took positions in that stock. Uh, we did a blog post in it uh, in October. So Jeroen, who's actually on the line, uh, he wrote the article. And his closing uh, paragraph was spot on, suggesting to traders a lot of the money, a lot of the profits had gone out of this trade. And be careful, because if the charts go against you, uh, you better have deep pockets. Uh, and I think... Uh, uh, Truer words were never spoken, uh, as has been as has proven to be the case. Uh, I also did a, an animation which uh, which said there's going to be three trends influencing uh, securities lending in the future. Uh, the first one was retail investors, and I actually mentioned uh, uh, Robinhood. So I suspected that it would be from a different angle. I, I certainly didn't see this coming. Otherwise, I would have been in there with them. Uh, and probably retired and not really doing this uh, this uh, live cast, um, but I wasn't. So there you go. But but now we have a situation where you've had a stock that uh, on December thirty first you could have bought into this money losing uh, a company for nineteen dollars a share ish, and today you I think it's trading around sort of sub one hundred around the one hundred dollar mark. Uh, and you can now have a share in that money losing uh, company for a hundred dollars. And if you bought it last week and the week before, maybe even a higher price to quote on that. But I don't think it's necessarily about the money itself, although the fundamentals of that original trade spotting a potential short squeeze uh, seem pretty sound and actually have proven themselves. But before we go any further, what I want to do is just take a step back and maybe ask Michael, can you give us an explanation of what is short selling? And then as a follow on from that, what's a short squeeze? Sure, happy to. Um, so when uh, I thinks it's going to go down, what he'll do is he'll look to sell it and then buy it back at a lower price. In order to be able to sell something he doesn't have, he has to borrow it. He can't. Um, it's called naked short. And so um, I guess the process is that he'll go out to the bank and a broker and he'll ask to borrow a stock. <laughs> he'll then go to the market and then hope that the stock's price will go down and buy it and he'll make a profit on the spread. Now the opposite can happen, the stock can go up and he wouldn't lose the difference between that. Um, so that suggests that short selling is, um, is based to borrow the stock, you also have to pay a fee. <clears throat> and um, for the majority of stocks, the fee is very minimal. For stocks that are in demand to borrow, the fee can be higher, supply and demand. So that's, uh, I guess, short selling in the basics. And then what a short squeeze is, <clears throat> is really when you know that price of the stock, instead of going down what the investors had hoped, goes up, the investors start to have market, market losses on their portfolio. And so really, as that stock continues to go up, and they want to buy it back to be able to get out of it and stop the pain um, from getting more. So if they sold it at 10 and it goes to 20, they've taken a loss of, of 10. And they want to buy it back because it could go to 30 or 40. <clears throat> and the more investors that start to want to buy it, it means that there's more demand in the stock, which means the price keeps going up. So I think <clears throat> that's the basics of uh, short squeeze and short selling. There's three, uh, I guess, important concepts I just wanted to briefly cover. The first one is short interest. And what short interest is, it's the number of shares that have been sold short. Um, and so if you look at um, a stock like GameStop, people will say, well, what's the short interest? That gives you an expression of how many people have actually shorted into the stock and how many people may potentially need to, um, to buy it back. The next cover, and what data cover references is okay, how many days of total volume? So, if that one day's volume, how many days will it take of that volume to reduce the short? And so, if you have people that are short the stock, it takes three days, it's three days to cover. Um, and the last one is shares outstanding. And so, 
a company will have a, a finite number of shares that are traded on the market. And that's the amount of shares that can be borrowed. And so if you look at the total number of shares, in this lead because a certain number of shares are owned as trade stock, which are not lent, or owned by the owner of the company, which are not lent. If you look at how many shares are actually in the company that's borrowed, it's a reduced number. So if you understand those three concepts, it gives you a pretty good idea about the extent of how GameStop was um, set up going into the short squeeze. Right. So thanks, Michael. Maybe maybe just uh, check a couple of things here. So I guess on all three of those counts, uh, if you would have looked at those numbers for GameStop, they would have shown some uh, uh, some potential opportunity for a squeeze, right? Not many shares outstanding, Correct, yes. and, um, uh, quite a lot of short interests. So, so why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I guess the actual data to um, you know, GameStop was one of the higher short interest names and was on um, everybody's radar because of that going into this. And I think your blog post uh, would reference this. And so people knew that the short interest and so the borrow was also going to pay a higher L borrow rate um, to do that. Um, and the same things for days to cover. So here is, is a real danger signal. It, shows that the amount of time it takes people to do this and it, you know it's the velocity of it can happen and again GameStop had one of the higher higher um, days to cover ratios across all the right so if you are a short seller <clears throat> if you have a position on or maybe even when you're taking sorry can I ask uh, I'm not certain who's getting emails but uh, uh, but no one's emailing me. Maybe I don't have any friends. Um, so, Michael, I guess I guess the thing there is, if I'm planning on putting a short position on, I'm going to want to know what the short interest already is, and I'm also going to want to know about how many shares are really out there available to borrow. Because there's one thing about getting into the position; the other, as has been proven, it can be a challenge to get out of a position, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, people will go to their brokers or private brokers, and they do a great job. At uh, it just comes down to it because everybody always wants to get in, in and out of positions at the time. Um, so, you know, there's a, this herd mentality and a rush to the exit. And that's what we've seen happen over the last two, three weeks is that, you know, there, everybody has a similar type of risk. Of and, you know, as you rush to the stock to continue to, to rise. And, and so, you know, all the new articles you see about the hedge fund losses are caught in this trap where, you know, if they, they try to hang on, they believe the stock is going to be worth less than when they shorted it, they have to be able to take this mark-to-market -market pain um, throughout. And eventually it becomes, they have to cover it. And, you know, that part of the system, you know, it stops a purple of, uh, I guess, the, the, the perfect storm, if you will. Um, you know, investors were, were stuck and many of them still believe in their, their fundamental analysis. You know, the risk parameters force them to um, to cover the short. Right, and I think I think we can get into that because I think that's a, a really a really important issue. But so thank you for setting that kind of ground. Maybe Sam will go over to you and uh, maybe you can uh, fill us in with some of the, uh, the the data related to this. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I think. Uh, you know, kind of looking at it, it's a very stark movement. I think it's uh, the basis of it in relatively few stocks, um, but then spread and the breadth of uh, you know, how the returns for uh, uh, for why, for uh, for highly short stocks were uh, you know kind of all moved together. Um, so yeah, if you could uh, put up the slides, I can. Um, I uh, just go through a couple of examples. Okay. Should be able to see it. So what we're looking at here is uh, for just the month of January, uh, returns broken out by the short interest as a percent of shares outstanding. Um, so each one of these is a is a bucket that represents 
uh, the U.S. equities that had short positions within a certain range. Um, so the all the way to the right bucket is saying uh, this is the returns for uh, as of the end of, Jan of uh, December, the stocks that had short interest greater than 30 percent of shares outstanding. Um, so this is a very stark return. And it would be strange to have a ranking you know, by any metric that would look like this over the course of a month. So if you were ranking by momentum or ranking by price to book or ranking by some other way of ranking the stocks, seeing this kind of breakout where all, all along the line in a Russell 3000 universe, more of this thing you know, equates with, uh, with returns uh, is a very stark thing that, is, uh, that stands out. Uh, so looking at the next slide, um, this is showing the returns over the course of time for the most expensive to borrow U.S. equities compared with the least expensive to borrow. Um, so the idea here, uh, it kind of reflects two things. One is um, what would be the returns if you shorted the most expensive to borrow stocks and, were, and, and did that against being long uh, the least shorted? Um, or if you just decided as a long only investor to not own the crowded shorts, uh, you know, what the returns would be, uh, you know, the difference there that you'd be gaining by kind of avoiding those stocks. Now, obviously, that's going to be based on the weight of those hard to borrow shares in an index, which is usually fairly small. Um, but when you start talking about this scale of outperformance, uh, it can still have an impact even, uh, you know, kind of foregoing the ownership of a relatively small part of the benchmark. Um, so the red line is showing the average return over the preceding 12 months. So kind of if you follow along with that line, at any point in that line, that would be sort of one return you had, had been generated um, by either uh, being short the crowded shorts or not owning them. So there are periods of time where you would have, uh, you know, that would have had relative outperformance of crowded shorts like 2013-14, um, the latter half of uh, 2016, but generally it would never even go past the zero bound in terms of uh, you know, what the return was over the last 12 months. Um, that is not true recently. Um, over the last year, uh, after the April uh, short squeeze, uh, the returns were basically hovering just above positive. And then the short squeeze in January uh, took them to decisively positive. So if you were a short seller, you're paying a substantial amount uh, for this borrow in names that are outperforming. Um, from 2008 to March of 2020, uh, there was an underperformance per month of an average of 1.3%. So that means that you would need uh, to either earn 15% by lending them or pay less than 15% to short them in order for that to have been worth doing. Uh, or if you look at the average over the last 12 months, it's an outperformance of 2.6%. So a dramatic inversion of that factor. Uh, if we shift now to the next slide, we'll look at some examples. I think one of the challenging things with a short squeeze is that uh, it, it's very specific to moments in time. So you may see a, you know, what appears to be a short squeeze in terms of a large price move in a heavily shorted stock, uh, but it doesn't end up washing out in the data because there might have been, uh, you know, a sort of short-term liquidity uh, situation that caused the short squeeze. But by the end of the day, um, short sellers are getting involved at the new higher price. Uh, so one of the things that you can do to help fill in some of the gaps is look at the securities finance data, uh, which shows the number of shares on loan every day. But it's important to realize that there's another part of that puzzle, which is the part that the dealers can internalize. And so the gap historically between the short interest and shares on loan is basically what the dealers were able to source away from the securities finance channel. And so as you see that getting larger, it means a larger part of the short position is being uh, sourced away from securities finance, possibly with uh, shares that will turn over more quickly. Um, so what we saw uh, starting uh, the beginning of last week with the 26th was just each day a sequential decline in the number of shares on loan. Uh, for the 26th, there was a subtraction of 6 million shares. Uh, for 27, minus 5.5 million shares. Uh, 28, minus 9.3 million shares. And uh, on the 29th minus 7.4 million shares. So every day we were seeing a number of shares uh, being returned um, as the share price was going higher, but I think hard to call it a short squeeze because uh, uh, there was so much more volume traded than was short positioning. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, this is showing AMC. And I think the point here is just that even when you're looking at short interest and share borrowing data, there can be more to it than would be obvious. Um, so what part of uh, what seems like happened last week was that there was this increase in borrowing related to a convertible. Um, so if you were looking just at the raw data, it would have looked like, oh, there's this big increase in borrowing. Is this you know, shorts getting more involved you know, at this new higher price? Um, but I think you know, with 
knowing the rest of what was going on, it seems more likely that it was a hedge that was probably uh, added uh, for the convert, which was then converted last week. And that's why we saw the shares on loan drop off when the trades from the 27th uh, settled on the 29th. If we look at the next slide, um, this is looking at 3D systems. I think probably a pretty clean example from early January of where uh, there was a single day, a very large price move, a very large reduction in shares on loan, and almost matching reduction in the short interest when it was subsequently reported. Um, so you can get so something like this is kind of as clean of a short squeeze example as you'll see um, compared with the others where there's more interpretation that uh, of the data that's important. And if we look at the last slide. Uh, this gives some idea of the positioning that I uh, kind of set up for this short squeeze this year on um, the number of dollars in short positions. Uh, if you look at the exchange short interest uh, shares times price has never been higher. And similarly, the um, uh, margin debit balances in customer accounts has also never been higher. So uh, suggesting leverage and um, a large amount of short positions, maybe not relative to the long positions of those short sellers, but in absolute terms, a large amount of short positions uh, coming into this year. Okay. So thank, thanks for that, Sam. That was, um, look, I think that was a huge amount of data. I think, I think you've made some, uh, you've made some good points there in the sense of, uh, it, it, there are, it, there's always noise, right? There's lots of different sorts of activity going on in any given, uh, name at any point in time. Uh, but certainly the, the, the thing that's got everyone's attention is, is no doubt the short squeeze. So, uh, so definitely the case. I just want to say, um, but but there's also there was a huge amount of data, and I had a chance to look at it before everyone else, and I still might come back with questions for you. So if anyone in the uh, in the audience that's watching has a question for Sam, feel free to pop it in. Uh, there's nothing he loves doing more than talking about the sort of the what the numbers are actually showing. Um, I want to say hello to. Um, uh, Zaf uh, Jeroon again, thanks for that. Uh, John Geno uh, joining us from the US and Drew, uh, your friendly neighborhood uh, spider journal uh, is here with us as well. A great question from Clive Shelton, which we will will be answering uh, in a minute after we get, uh, get to John. Uh, so John, uh, maybe I can ask you now to uh, take us through some more of the background, more of the status, more of, of where we are. Okay, I mean, a lot's been said. And I, I think to some extent, I mean, I think everyone knows what happened last week in terms of the share price uh, increase and, uh, and, the, and the subsequent squeeze. I mean, GameStop's been a story for about four years. I mean, it hasn't turned a profit since well, five years, actually. In 2017, its, it's revenue was down 90% from 16, and it was kind of languishing until it had this deal with Microsoft um, to use its business applications. So it's a question of they're shifting their, their business model away from bricks and mortar, which of course is, is dead. Um, and the question is, what, what, where are they going to turn that around? Now, I think the, the question that really has to be asked here is, was, the, was this investors um, buying these shares to invest in? And the answer is absolutely not. This had nothing to do with investing. Investing is a serious business. And I think you can tell from the action in other stocks like AMC Networks, for example, whose share price rose 70% last week until it dropped uh, almost as quickly as it rose because it was the wrong stock to squeeze. So my question that I would like to raise, and it's going to be a debate at some point, is what motivated uh, the Reddit group and others to do this? Bearing in mind that not everybody who was getting on the bandwagon was um, was a retail investor ryan cohen apparently was long as was uh, michael burry who you may have heard of so i think this was born out of the same drive that actually um creates fintechs i think it looks at a at, at a an institutional process and say we could do it better faster or quicker we don't like what we see now when that and when that sentiment is turned to good things like fintechs which those that go on to be successful. And the payments industry is a classic example where there is so much activity in it. One of them is going to do really, really well, if not, or, if not they already have done. Um, and that could be useful for consumers and society as a whole. 
What happened last week, though, was not about that. To me, it was about anger. And it was anger directed at a perceived group of people, hedge funds, and maybe Wall Street in general, which is a very broad brush, um, against something they perceive to be either corrupt or, or wrong, or that short selling in itself is somehow uh, to be blamed. Unfortunately, the minute the short selling came up, we are going around the houses yet again with criticism from uh, Roy. Who was the congresswoman that wants to, that was quite vocal about this? Uh, you know, I'm like the worst person in the world for names. Uh, AOC? No, it was a congresswoman in, uh, in California. She has been the head of a, of a finance committee in the past, but she was very vocal about, uh, we need to investigate short selling, this is destroying pension funds, etc. I mean, for as long as I've known Roy, which is over 25 years, we've had this debate. We defended short selling. I'm sure you guys, on the on, as the panelists, have done so as well. It, we're never going to win this argument. It's always going to be a problem, despite the fact that almost every uh, developed market in the world has an element of short selling or, or absolutely endorses it and improves it, including the G20. So, so if that argument's never going to be won. Now, the reason why the anger exists, I think, is something to do with being disenfranchised. Um, I don't buy into the argument that it, it was payback for the global financial crisis because I'm going to make a hazard that some of these people are probably in their 20s and I think they're probably too young to have suffered from that. But I could be wrong. But if, even if they're in their 20s and 30s, the millennial, um, let's call them millennials, although not strictly true, um, there's a, there is a disparity, there, there is a gap in society between uh, our generation and our parents' generation, which bought their own homes and can, and can finance them, with them not even being able to get onto the ladder. And I think that's part of the, um, I'm not going to use bad language, but it's part of the FU to Wall Street in that they just feel angry towards something that they can't quite pinpoint. So what happened last week was, I'm going to throw money away if it works. Um, well, <laughs> two things. I'm going to prepare to lose the money if it doesn't work, but if it does work, I'll actually make some money. And I've read a couple of anecdotal stories on, on Reddit whereby one guy uh, with a 50,000 options um, position made 23 million. I also read, of course, somebody else that was, when GameStop was sus suspended itself, um, he felt that he lost $700,000. And those stories will come out of the woodwork going forward. The question we need to answer is, is what happened absolutely fine? Um, should there be regulation, more regulation than that already exists? And should the likes of Robin Hood commission-free entities change the model that they use in order to protect their, their client base? And, and I guess that's going to be the push and pull between um, over, over heavily regulated markets, which I don't think anybody wants, versus uh, a level of protection or duty of care to your client base. So I have my opinions about this, but I don't want to say I guess what others might say, Roy. Cool. Right. Thank, thanks for that, John. Um, look, I, I think there's a lot to unpack in there. Uh, just uh, the person John was referring to was, was indeed Maxine Waters. Drew Maxine. Nichols knows that because he wrote the article and and uh, and I added a, a few comments. AOC, of course, also did jump on uh, to the issue and has been uh, calling for uh, uh, comments. So it's really it's both of them. Uh, both answers are acceptable. Um, what I want to do is is really start uh, unpacking Clive's question. Uh, you know, a lot of the audience here will be from the securities lending community. Um, at, at a very simple uh, base, in fact, I think I can actually show um, show Clive's question. So uh, his question is, um, stock lending is said to be part of the problem. Can a panel explain why would retail fund managers who are long only lend stock for a small fee to short sellers, deliberately facilitating activity which may diminish their portfolios? And Clive thinks... It's bonkers. Um, maybe Sam, why don't you just start with um, with the obvious, which is the economics for uh, the uh, lenders? Oh, you're on mute. 
just FYI. Sorry. I'm um, sorry. Yes. So I think there's a few things there. I mean, I think it's a fair point when people talk about, you know, price discovery is the reason why you should, you know, short selling is a good thing that if you own a security, are you interested in discovering a new lower price for that security? Probably not. Um, so I think that's fair. But then I think when you think about it in the context of something like GameStop, the fact that it was highly shorted probably had something to do with the price going up so much. Now, it's a little abstract, but I think it's easier maybe if you think about it for something like Tesla, where by lending those shares, you facilitate the issuance of a convertible debt. And so if no one was lending, it would affect the, ability, the fund, firm's ability to fund themselves. Um, so I think there's all of that sort of how does the market structure aspect. And then there's also just the uh, returns available. Um, GameStop was the most revenue generating security globally in January. Um, and I think that's always kind of when executives talk about, you know, um, the shorts is kind of, well, you know, uh, your investors are the longs and, you know, that's where they're getting the shares from. Right. And I think your data from last year said that the fees were somewhere around the $9 billion level. Is that correct? But do you recall? Yes. In terms of global revenue. Uh, yes. Yeah. So what that means is long investors earned $9 billion from effectively renting out their portfolio. But look, there's more to it than that. So thanks for that, Sam. I'm wondering, Ben, if you want to add anything to, to <coughs> Yeah, I would. Um, thanks. I would say a couple things here. Um, one, the point about um, the fund managers, which are long stock for a small fee, I would say in general, the most, the easily borrowed names, they receive a very, very small fee, you know, anywhere from 25, 10, 15, 20, 30 basis points for lending that stock um, through the lenders. Now, in some cases, like in GameStop, you know, the charge to borrow that stock was 50%. So I don't know, you know, exactly the deal that the fund managers that are lending that stock cut with the, you know, custodian or brokers to lend that out, but it's easily safe to say that they were getting five, 10, 15, 20% to do so. So they're gaining out performance by lending a security that they own. And then I guess, you know, and lots of hedge funds do this as well. And I think I don't, think necessarily is the right way to view it that they're you know cannibalizing themselves by lending it by allowing it in fact i think that they're more confident that this stock will continue to rise and that's why they are a fundamental investor in it so lending it is not going to hurt their position and in fact if it does continue to rise it will not necessarily create create a short squeeze up to this magnitude but will force those that did buy it uh, sorry, that are borrowing it to short to rebuy it back probably at a higher level and maybe create a bit more momentum in it. Yeah, so I think that's a that's a great that's a great point, Ben. Look, the at the end of the day, there is no, you know, hedge funds aren't magicians. They aren't always right. They're like any other investor. They're just taking a view. And it, it's also not the case that it that it's only one dimensional. Like, oh, we're going to short sell GameStop because it's going to go down. If we look at if we look at other trading strategies, right? Short selling is a part of a strategy. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think most shorting in general, outside of the ones that you see in the news, which is like we think it's a fraud, it's going to zero, and there's firms that put out reports and this and that on it. Um, you know, that's what most people know about. But in fact, most people use it as an offsetting position to hedge something that they're long. So for instance, I don't know, you're long um, Goldman Sachs, and then on the other side of it, you're short Morgan Stanley stock because you, you believe that the ratio between those and the spread that Goldman will go up more than Morgan Stanley will. So you have a bit of an offsetting and hedge position to uh, remove some of your risk. Um, and it also helps with leverage. Right. And so one of the things that uh, I know has been the case as people have been covering their GameStop positions, the hedge funds that were short, uh, some of them also had to close out long positions as well. So it actually, people don't always realize that since these are, as you say, kind of packaged as hedges, uh, that a closing of one position has a knock-on effect on the other side of the market, the long only side, right? Roy, could you um, pull up that slide I sent you? Uh, yeah, if you give me a minute, 
and uh, talk amongst yourselves or to the audience. But so thanks, that Ben. Yeah, John, I'm interested. Uh, mm -hmm. While I do that, can you maybe talk about it from the kind of perspective that securities lenders uh, look at it and the conversations you've had with customers over the years? I mean, to answer Clive's question in some ways, because I suspect that Clive's coming from the point that he doesn't like um, short selling. But the reality is that, you know, as, as Ben just said, I mean, yeah, a market maker needs to make two-way prices and he, he may find himself short because he's had to sell to a client and, and actually likes the stock, in, in which case he will borrow it. We always refer to set lending and short selling being completely uh, joined to the hit, but it's not always the case. It's not always the reason why we, we lend securities. I mean, I lent, I, I've lent in, my, in the past, I lent billions and billions of government debt simply because it was a regulatory requirement from, from the broker dealers. So um, I don't think, Clive, that you can ever, you can never, not, not the standing game stop, but typically the short selling crowd never really have the ability to move the stock price that far. And if you don't have short selling, what do you have? Long only unfettered markets that can just keep on rising. And, and you need to make, you need to express, I think the markets need to express two way opinions. Um, I, so I don't think the, the set lending that we're talking about here facilitates necessarily um, a, a drop in price. Ideally, that is, the, that is the aim of the absolute short seller. But if it were the case, the securities lending agency business wouldn't have asset managers, pension funds, central banks in their lending programs, knowing full well that they're actually lending on occasion, probably the line share of the occasion, that somebody somewhere is short. It's part, it's part of the fabric of, of, the, of the markets to make them work efficiently and, and, re and reduce spread. Great, John. Thanks. Thanks. For that. I now have your chart, and I and when you're finished with your chart, I'm going to make one sort of closing comment to uh, to Clive because I think that's really the nub of of the maybe a, a big chunk of this discussion for this audience. But uh, hopefully, uh, now you can see your screen. There you go. And let me just remove. Clive. There you go. So I, I found this during the week, and I thought this was interesting for the for the simply for the sake that short sellers aren't that good at it. Um, this is over a um, you, you, so what what this is showing you is the short interest. What well, it tells you in the title. So it's the, it's the Russell two thousand with the, the the highest level of short interest. So the the, the blue to the right has a thirty percent short interest, interest, but its stock performance this year is up twenty three percent. So those, those short sellers are really suffering. Now you'd expect to see a crowd down by the left-hand um, scale of, of this, which you do, but you can see the outliers. There's some that have, um, only have a short interest of, of 5% and have actually increased 15%. But anything above the line isn't doing particularly well. Um, so it is sometimes painful to hold these positions and sometimes you're gonna be wrong. And I think this, this shows that it's not all it's not all, um, you know, rainbows and teddy bears. Yeah. Interestingly, the last six months, you know, in Asia, there are a few, few countries that stopped allowing short selling Malaysia being one yeah. and the, the Malaysian stock market only went up 66 bips in the last six months versus Japan, which didn't up 23 and a half. So just because you restrict short sellers doesn't mean that everyone's going to do well. Look, I, I think that I think that's a that, that's a fantastic place to end. Look, um, Clive, and and we appreciate that you've kind of uh, uh, taken in what uh, Ben and John have said. Uh, hedge funds express a view. That's all it is. They're, they're like any other sort of asset manager, portfolio manager. And if you think about it, anytime you buy a stock, you're expressing an opposite opinion of the person selling it to you. Because if they thought it was going up they wouldn't be selling it to you, right? So so the whole fundamental basis of investment markets is a series of differing opinions. And hedge funds can take these differing opinions and go short as part of a strategy, which means that even if the market rises, they can, they can, uh, they can make money because they might lose money on their short, uh, but make money on the long position and, and they're hedged if it goes the other way around. So look, there's a, a, a series of, of really uh, interesting sort of versions on that. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, 
the, the question is about your long-term fundamental view. Tesla is a great example. Uh, despite the views of many in the, sh in the, the short community, um, the stock price has continued to rise. And if you've been an investor in Tesla, you've made quite a lot of money from just the share price rise and you've made a, a ton of money as well from lending out to your portfolio to people that were wrong. All right. So, um, so that's, you know, it's a market. So, um, so thanks for that. Um, so I want to, uh, get a feel now for, um, uh, maybe, maybe the, the nature of the market. You know, a lot of this has been a question of, um, uh, David versus Goliath, right? You know, and, and the issue is, you know, Ryan Cohen, I think, who John mentioned earlier, he put this thesis out there, said, look, this stock is ripe for a, a short squeeze. So it, it definitely 100% started as an economic trade. And then maybe it's kind of morphed into uh, uh, into something else beyond that. And, and I'm, uh, you know, again, some of the things I've seen are people saying, well, you know, I got my, <laughs> I got my, um, my COVID check, uh, and I didn't really need the money, so no big loss to me. So, so I'm wondering, uh, to what extent do you guys think that that this has occurred partly because of the the actual the prevailing world that we've been in over the past year? I don't know if anyone wants to. Uh, um, ben, you're 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 nodding your head uh, quite. Yeah. I've listened. I've thought a lot about it and listened to this uh, from various views, and uh, I think two things. One, it's always been said that the institutional investor or hedge fund has the ability to do things that retail community does not. And this will, uh, this very finite example proves that's not true. One, um, individuals can short stocks uh, through their brokers. And two, an individual person who does not focus on markets as a profession figured this out that they could get this short squeeze to happen. It was ripe for it. So they were able to uncover that data. So they didn't have... You know, f hedge funds may be able to get the data quicker and easier, but it certainly proves that there is data available out there for the individual to find. Um, and then I think a little bit about this, what I thought is, you know, not kind of like, why did this happen, but why did it take so long? You know, it's kind of the things that we've seen in the society of, loss, you know, the three culminations in general of people have lost faith in experts uh, since and in financial since the GFC in 08, particularly. Everyone worships crowds. Everyone wants to read a Yelp review or Facebook like or thumbs up. Um, and, you know, it's easier for those crowds to form with social media and everyone trusts crowd uh, opinion implicitly, it seems. And then everything's become very personal in the world. So, all disagreements eventually go personal and politicized. And I think that these changes in in trends in the society that we've seen in politics and everywhere else, it's now just come together in public markets. But in the end, I don't think it's going to be positive for anyone. Um, you know, I think it's smarter to look after your own self-interest first. So if, if your main goal is to hurt a hedge fund, I mean, it's kind of difficult because another one could just pop up tomorrow. Um, but at the end of the day, you're still left holding some asset that you may lose money on. And how many times can you do that? So I think that understanding what the end means is, is good. And it's okay if you want to hurt somebody, I guess, or, you know, F the man. But that probably should be the byproduct of doing something beneficial for yourself first um, and holding an asset that you do view as being valuable. Or, you, you know, you can momentum trade and hopefully you got out in time. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a. I, I'm going to come back to this sort of social aspect in a, in a second. Um, let me say two things. So, uh, number one, uh, Clive, thanks for joining us, and Rule, thanks for the kind words. I uh, appreciate that. And just like you said, Ben, uh, if people if people really like something, you know, everyone gets a buzz out of pressing the like button. So, if you like this episode, give us a like because we love it just like everyone else. We're 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 social media obsessed ourselves. Um, Roy. Can I just ask Ben a quick question? Okay, John. Yeah. Um, in the absence, Ben, of um, any investigation that proves some action that was uh, either broke regulation or, or should have taken place, do you, would you say that on balance, what happened last week should be allowed to happen again without any interference? Uh, yeah, I think so. As long as they're not colluding, I mean, as long as the SEC determines that they didn't they don't have joint funds um, and collusion and market manipulation. I think putting a view out there makes sense. Um, and then also, you know, 
I've kind of learned throughout the years of trading it like no one person or fund is bigger than the market. And eventually we have efficient markets and they go back. Your timing may just be wrong. So, yes, I don't see an issue with it technically. Uh, okay, I tend to agree. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I agree on that as well. So I think uh, I, I think we probably all agree. But, you know, if people, you know, I and this is one thing, I'll be honest with you, I've completely changed my view on it. I used to think uh, that this should be, uh, you know, investigated, slowed down, whatever. Uh, but I've, I've completely changed my mind in the last few days. Um, before I go to Sam, who's going to answer um, uh, another great question from the audience on uh, on short interest exceeding 100%, uh, because we started 10 minutes late, uh, we'll carry on. I don't know if all the, 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 the guests on the panel can carry on that extra 10 minutes, uh, but we'll, we'll be going for another 15 minutes for as many of you in the audience and on the panel that can stay with us. So, uh, Sam, the question being asked is how the heck can short interest exceed 100% of the shares in, in issue as well, how the options market gave retail investors leverage to exploit the squeeze? Great, so I'll have uh, more to say on the first point of that question. And I think the important thing there to think about is that there are some number of shares outstanding and every day those shares will settle into someone's custody. So if there's an existing security loan where the owner of the shares lent them to somebody else who then short sold them to someone else, unless either party of that is undoing that trade, that's sort of irrelevant in terms of what's going to happen with settlement today. And so the shares outstanding today will all be in someone's account. And I think the easiest way to think about how you could get past 100 is to sort of start with an example where you say, okay, there's one shareholder, they own all of the shares. And there's one short seller, and every day that short seller borrows 100 shares from the long holder and short sells them back to the long holder. So they're the only two market players. And so every day it goes like that with 100 shares, and eventually the short seller will be short 100% of the shares, and the long holder will have lent out 100% of their original holdings, but they'll have bought back all of those shares. So they're still long 100% of the shares outstanding on day T plus one, and they could lend those shares again. And the only thing that they couldn't do is lend more than 100% of the shares outstanding in a single day. And that's also why I think the metric makes sense. I mean, I think there's a justification for thinking about, oh, well, you should increase the number of shares in the denominator to account for the new shares um, that have been created by lending. Um, but I think the reason from a short perspective, it's there is a significance there is that it isn't a measurement of what percentage out of a total, like it's consuming that percentage. It's more like when you get past 100, that means that you couldn't settle the entire short position in one day. Now, you probably couldn't even weigh before that because there's not usually going to be 100% of the shares. You know, not all of the shareholders make every share available every day. And so that's why, you know, as you kind of start with, you know, at some initial state where there's no shares on loan and go from there, um, you're likely to get into a scenario in the initial state where not everyone's going to lend. And then of who is, and they get lent and short sold, not everybody who bought those shares is going to be willing to lend. But I think thinking about it in that kind of simple case helps with the mechanics of like, how could you get there? Um, I think for the point on the options market, I will uh, leave that less uh, more my forte. Yep. Uh, does anyone want to pick up the options question? I think Michael, Michael, if not, I can. Michael? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so much you know, there's um, I think I think your sound uh, I'm showing a bad connection, Michael. So I don't know, Ben. So, maybe yeah. Can... So basically, if there, if you're buying options, someone had to write those options, and if the market maker is writing those those call options, um, part of that part of the the mathematical equation of the Greeks in that option is is known as, as gamma. And the market makers use gamma to figure out how much to hedge their bet. So if someone bought 10 options in GameStop, you know, for every percent move, you know, they're going to have to take into that account that there's going to be risk as the stock goes up and buy more stock to hedge themselves. So the larger, you know, the higher the gamma becomes, 
the larger the stock position in the market maker needs to have in order to have an effective hedge against all of those open options positions. So there is this known gamma effect and it happens all the time, not just in this, it happens in all kinds of derivatives. Um, and it's kind of compounding and forcing the market maker to go into the market and buy more stock, which is not necessarily, I would say natural or momentum. He doesn't want to have to be buying that stock, but he does to prevent his losses from increasing as the stock's going up. And the exponential rate at which this did is is why you saw that massive compounding effect. And and Ben, that was exacerbated by people buying really, really way out of the money call options that all of a sudden started being in the money the higher the, the stock skyrocketed, right? Yeah, I mean, like you're 150% out of the money. You, you know, you usually have quite a bit of time to hedge that by the time it's near that 50% out of the 100, you know? Yeah, so so like, um, uh, hopefully sure. that uh, answered your question. Uh, John, you want to add yes, to that? Yes, I just wanted to add to it because the, 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 the element of the question was about retail investors. Um, I mean, I I think this was this was largely part of the problem because it was the options, it was call options that drove this thing in a straight line. Now, I think the question Andrew was asking is, should retail investors have access to being able to buy call options, which are only part of the premium. And I think it's going to be one of the debates that comes out of any investigation the SEC has. Um, Robin Hood will tell you that that's the platform they've developed and that's what they've given to retail. And why shouldn't they be, be able to access the markets like any other in institution, which is this whole, I don't particularly like this word, but the de de democ democratizing of, of finance, I think it's I think it's um, it's much more of a complex issue. Um, for those that had for those that had deep in the money call options that exercised them, Andrew, they are now sitting on a pretty penny, and assuming they got out of their position. So, um, in some ways, it, it is exacerbating the problem that Ben just described. Should should it happen? Why not? And I think the why not is is for regulators to decide. And I think regulators are going to be very very uh, reluctant to really interfere on this stage because if they're going to interfere on a retail basis, it has to apply to the entire market, and the entire market is allowed to trade options. I mean, a retail market could also have been writing those calls. It didn't have to be a market maker, and may just may not have hedged themselves. Maybe they were they were covered, so they weren't writing them naked. But you know, it, at the end of the day, like I said, it, the market's efficient, and it will be. You just might be wrong on the timing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, guys, I dropped, but I wanted to make the point that um, you know these low-cost brokerage models that are you know zero commissions, they're they're able to do that because they're selling the payment order flow to market makers, and the largest spread that market makers make is through options, and so if if you think about that, you know, like Robinhood, they're making hundreds of millions of dollars in selling that order flow onto firms like Citadel and Susquehanna. With two sigma, which you know is, is fine. Um, they're you know they they're supposed to get them best execution, but I think it's important for everybody in the market to understand that you know if you don't get anything for free, and by giving this flow to these market makers, they're able to make a spread, and options is where they make their most money. And so, the market's incentivized from these market makers to keep options going, and I think from the retail investor perspective. You know, the focus on short selling is, is great, and um, hopefully everybody gets to understand more. But if this is the one sort of active point, which I think people should be very much aware. Of. <clears throat> yeah, and Michael, um, I, if we've had some sound, but the information as far as the money that these platforms make, that's publicly disclosed information, right? That they they actually sell these orders and get revenue. <clears throat> Yeah, of course. So if you look at the Robin Hood's um, uh, earnings statements, you can see that they're, they're driving. So there's nothing wrong with what anybody's doing. It's all above board. It's all legitimate. I think where um, I think it's important is that people just understand what the what, how it works, and that understanding you know should help people be able to, to trade these kind of events. Um, and I think that education is, is hopefully what comes with all of this. Um, 
you know, the, the fintechs, as you said, have done a great job. <clears throat> but I think what what's, hasn't happened well um, or could be improved is just everybody understanding who's getting paid what and why. Um, and so we're all in consumers. Too. For the transparency reasons, every individual or institutional investor can look at their brokerage and go on. They have to, they're required by SEC rules, SEC rule 606 to disclose the percentage and the names of where all of their order flow is going. Uh, so you can look those up on any brokerage account. And, you know, like he said, it's not here nor there or bad or not bad. It's just they need to disclose it so, so you can know and form your opinion. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, because I I used uh, I used one um, uh, for my because they do fractional shares and I can't afford a full share so uh, I need someone that can do fractions um, so but I'm you know, to be honest with you, I wasn't aware I, I didn't because I didn't think about it I knew that there's no such thing as free but I wasn't really all that clear on uh, on on where they were making their money but I had this suspicion that there was money being made somewhere. Um, so, so I think, I think this will certainly shine some light on it. I think people have a better understanding of it now. Um, the, the, one of the issues that I, I'm not certain if anyone is really in a position to comment on because, uh, we had obviously the Redditors who were doing their thing. We then had the hedge funds who, uh, who proactively started covering shorts as the, uh, as the price started moving against them. You also then had uh, um, uh, short sellers who were who were forced to close out by their by their PBs, uh, and you had the options market makers having to buy into the market to uh, to uh, cover their their exposures for for the call options. Uh, but you know, it seems to me that this isn't completely David versus Goliath. You know, if you if I'm a momentum trader, I'm happy to jump on any old bandwagon uh, up or down. So I I think it's unlikely given the size of the orders that these are all just retail orders doing their uh you know their two thousand dollar or six hundred dollar checks uh, i don't know if anyone has any sort of uh thoughts on that apparently not so that'll be for you guys in the audience what do you actually think do you think that any of this was actually done by the institutions, because I suspect there were hedge funds that were actually on the long side of this that actually made money on the way up. So it's kind of ironic, if I'm right, which I may not be, uh, I think it's ironic that the the FU to the man and hedge funds in particular ends up making money for some of the hedge funds. So uh, I, I think- Yeah, Roy, I, I, wasn't, I didn't respond because I was just looking for some stats that I had. And it looks like the number of, um, the explosion in, in options trading called call is very much concentrated in the 10 core contracts or less. And that is at record levels of 34 billion on a rolling four week basis. So it does suggest the options market is, is driven by retail, um, which is to the point that was made by, um, by one of the questions that, okay, should they, be, should, have, should they have leverage? And because a fully paid for share is one thing, you've really got skin in the game at that point. But a premium of say I don't know if it's trading at 10, 90 or hundred dollars today, if you're putting ten bucks, it's a very it's a very different animal. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I suspect that why not um, caveat emptor. I'm sure you had systematic trading that's momentum driven with their models that would have easily caught this in the price moves, and yeah, they case. probably would have gone long. They may have gone short, but there's no way it was there was not a handful of institutional pl players in this and, and it could have just been computer driven strategies and one thing that we have a pretty clear view on is the uh the position in the amc debt um that's been uh you know clarified uh publicly in terms of um, profits made by the uh the amc debt holders Okay, thanks. Um, so we've had another we've had another couple of uh, comments. And, uh, great. Uh, so thanks very much for the kind words, Linda. Uh, Dan, uh, I'll come back to you on that question uh, afterwards. And Clive, I think Clive's drawn a really interesting analogy here between uh, uh, Ben's point uh, for the options market makers covering their positions and almost like banks with fractional uh, fractional lending, right? You know, this whole thing that you're actually 
cr providing leverage to people and there isn't actually enough cash in the account to actually cover that. So by writing the call options, you end up having to create artificial demand. I, you know, I can't remember the words you used exactly, Ben, but these aren't, these aren't positions they want to have, they're the positions that they end up having to have. So it's, I, I think it's an interesting uh, uh, comparison to that. Um, w there is there is one particular issue that we didn't uh, cover off, and I don't know the answer to this, but um, the explanation given by um, a number of the platforms, Robinhood and others, as to why they stopped investors from doing fully paid for uh, purchases of GameStop was that their clearing requirements at DTC uh, required them to post uh, additional collateral and because of the scale of the activity they just didn't have uh, enough collateral to do that and had to stop people from uh, executing new orders but they could close out buy positions because obviously that would uh, that would reduce the position um, any anyone want to wade in on that uh, sure I can if no one else wants to sure go go ahead Ben thanks um, yeah so I mean like any other institution um, you know, you have to have risk metrics in order to cover the financials uh, that are necessary. And that's every broker dealer. I mean, every bro there's broker dealers that go out of business all the time because of this. So, you know, the second somebody's margin gets too out of control and they get worried that they're going to be unable to facilitate that margin requirement, they have the right to stop them from trading. So, I, the, and we saw comments from the politicians of like, why did they stop retail? I mean, this happens for institutions as well. I mean, you could get carried out in a position and the prime broker calls you and says, sorry, you know, you need to cut, you need to sell some securities that, that we have on your behalf because we don't think that you can, you'll be able to meet those margin requirements. Um, and the problem was most places, most clearing firms or large institutions that have their own clearing, it wouldn't have got to that point where they would have ha having to meet uh, clearing obligations. They would have stopped it before it even got there. The problem was Robinhood doesn't have those uh, risk capabilities or metrics in place, and it got so far beyond their control that then, the clear that then their clearing partners who they also pay a lot of money to were worried about themselves losing uh, a lot of money, so then they forced them to stop. Yeah, it's interesting with all of the interplay between these things. So you have uh, this this sort of Reddit initiated group creating volumes and activity to you know to to protest or to make money or to identify a, a short squeeze using a vehicle like Robinhood and and the other platforms to 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 generate their trading activity. But the very volumes that they were pumping through were the things that ended up being self limiting uh, in in that sense because. I don't think, as, as you said, any of these firms necessarily had a view that the scale of it could scale up that quickly. Businesses typically don't skyrocket like that, any business. So uh, quite ironic. Uh, listen, we've gone, uh, we've gone over the hour. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Ben. Uh, and, uh, and good that you feel like your questions got answered, uh, Andrew. Uh, I think there were some good answers there. Um, I'm just going to ask everyone to do just a quick wrap up, just like one minute. Uh, where, where do you think that we actually go from here? Uh, so the, uh, Michael, maybe if I can start with you, where do you think we go? Uh, I don't know whether it's regulatory or just market action or just anything you think is relevant. Yeah, I think um, it's the next couple of months and um, we'll be a discovery phase. And so I think, uh, you know, hopefully things settle down and, um, you know, people can sort of start reading, and uh, I guess our our hope um, is that we doing stuff like this and talking to people, um, everybody gets a better understanding of of what um, what actually works. And I think, you know, people uh, to Ben's point earlier, you know, things are more connected now, um, but things also seem the velocity of change seems to be fast. So I honestly think that this will be old news in a month. Um, and hopefully get some positive out of it. Yeah, and I think to, to your point, I think there's probably never been a time where um, the, the value of having someone on point on trading has been more important. You know, even 
you know, Carson Block mentioned that they didn't have a full-time trader until November last year. And, and now they've realized that this is actually a trading game as much as it is a, a portfolio selection game. So uh, it's staying on top of it's critical. Thank, thanks, Michael. Uh, ben. Um, yeah, no, so I think Michael was correct. And, you know, I think kind of what I said earlier is people not trusting the experts. But in the end, you kind of see that experts a lot of times save um, save the people that were against the experts. And in this case, you know, when they stopped, when Ramanu was forced to stop their clients from trading, the DTC, which is basically saying this stuff is just too risky, we need to cut you off, um, was one of those stop gaps um, because it could have made Robinhood go out of business, which then ultimately their retail clients would have lost all of their money, or I guess the F FDIC would have covered a bunch of it. Um, but not all experts are there to exploit. Whereas businesses sometimes are there to exploit you and you need to look into the details of that. And usually you can look at experts, blogs and information about it to get a better idea of exactly what they're doing under the hood, which is interestingly one of Robin Hood's blog called Under the Hood, where currently yesterday they've said, we, want, we think that our clients are at risk. Everything should be a T plus zero settlement, which in the end just makes them more money. So I think, you know, Experts are a good thing, and it tests your knowledge and understanding of what you're getting into. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Ben. T plus zero is logistically a nightmare and doesn't take into account a 24-hour world of portfolio managers and is why Saudi Arabia moved away from T zero settlement because it was restricting investment. So so that's a, that's an interesting point. Uh, you know, I'll come to you in a minute. John. I was just going to say, unless you do it over a blockchain. You still will have the issue of uh, portfolio managers on the West Coast versus uh, other locations. Yeah. So, it so happened in China when they did the China Connect. I was there. The yeah. biggest funds in the world could not get the ask, get the money there quick enough. Yeah. So unless for people... For that reason. Yeah. <clears throat> so, that, so that's an issue. And again, uh, just for those that think there was unfair treatment of... Uh, of retail investors, uh, again, I think Carson Block, again, Muddy Waters, came out yesterday saying that there were firms that they were dealing with that told them they couldn't be doing uh, any buying either. So it was uh, it was more than just retail investors. So thanks for that. Uh, Sam, maybe I can turn to you. Great, thanks. Um, so I think uh, really the big picture for me is just that, you know, this stuff's complicated and you have to pay attention if you want to participate. Um, I think there's a lot of really good data and there's equally possibly more important analytics, which is what do you do with the data? What does it mean? Uh, what's behind it? When is it published? What's the delay? How should I interpret it today? Um, that uh, go far beyond just having you know the access to the data itself. So I think both of those things uh, have never been more available or important. Uh, I have nothing to add to such a succinct uh, statement. So thanks for that. Um, and John. Over to you. I think um, any investigation by the SEC or whatever, any other body, is probably um, apt and worthwhile. Um, Robin Hood's, um, um, in, in the app, in the TNCs, in the app, they deny trading or they have the, they, they withdraw, they withhold the right to suspend trading and deny trading at any time. So the idea that these, the lawsuit, I think there's two lawsuits against them, I think they won't go anywhere. I think it's. I think what will really happen, though, is the structure of what happened and the relationship between Robinhood, Citadel, and perhaps other hedge funds is going to be a circular argument that may may be brought into question. And the fact that a hedge fund can lose thirty percent of its portfolio within a, over this is going to have to really look at the risk models that they employ because that isn't good for the industry or the markets as a whole. Um, so my my view is. Um, let's look. Let's see what it uncovers, if anything, and and if there's any changes to to regulation as a whole. Although I doubt it will be the case. I think I think Powell said that there's less than 20 stocks that have a market cap of a billion. This this isn't go, this doesn't matter, but it does matter because of look what happened. So it's an interesting story, and I think it will go on for a few months. Um, I think um, I think. Michael said it, it will be yesterday's story fairly soon. But if the sentiment that was driving these Reddit, invest, uh, Reddit 
uh, group users to do this is still there, then it will happen again. Okay. And, nice. and, it, pro and it probably should. Yeah. Thanks, John. Look, for me, uh, I think markets should be open and people should uh, have the right to look dumb uh, and make mistakes. I've certainly lost money many times uh, and I've, I've got lots of stories about that. Um, but look, as long as, as long as there's a certain degree of qualification on the way in, uh, why not? And if some people want to treat it like a lottery ticket and uh, recognize that when buying, they might turn out to be worth zero, I think they should have the right to do that. The service providers have to have the infrastructure to actually be, be able to deal with that um, appropriately. If I can uh, just do a, a last minute plug. So we launched the PeerPoint Alpha community, uh, whatever, last week, last Monday. And it's a sort of a private membership club and it's exactly designed for issues like this. So we are in uh, 10 minutes going on to a private live event for the, the, the members of the, the pack, as we call it. If you're interested in finding out more, go there. Listen, I hope, I hope you've, you've enjoyed it. We've had a lot of great comments. Michael, about blockchain, it's a topic we'll definitely be coming back to. So uh, maybe we'll even get in touch with you to see what you think. Um, uh, I want to thank a fantastic uh, panelist. Uh, ben, Michael, Sam, and John, I really appreciate that. And these and these were the best questions uh, that we've received on any of these events. Normally, we're holding these live on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. UK time. Uh, we might revisit that time given the, uh, the, the great um, turnout today. So thanks, everyone. This will be recorded. Uh, also, if you're watching it on the recording, uh, feel free to leave comments. As I said, we revisit and uh, comment there. So with that, Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. And uh, see you next time. Thank you.